This is Whitney, and you're listening to the Jcast on Jabberlog. Welcome to Within the Trenches, true stories from the 911 dispatchers who live them. Hey, what's going on? This is Ricardo with Jabberlog on the Jcast, and I'm sitting here with my co-host, Whitney, and this is episode number 10 of Within the Trenches. What's going on, Whit? Hey, I'm so glad to be back for another episode. We've had, I've had quite a long week already. Yeah. How about yourself? Uh, you know it. I, have, have you missed me? I haven't been course. on nights this week. Of course. I know. Yeah, I, I got been... stuck on days for the next two weeks, so I'm working 5A to 5P. I left my house at 2.30 this morning. Yeah, it's been uh, rather interesting for myself. I was working last night. Um, I worked 4.30 to 4.30. And then after that, I, uh, I I got out. I crashed out here in dispatch. And for anybody who works, uh, you know, in the dispatch profession, you know that sometimes you have to stay in dispatch mm-hmm. and sleep it off. Well, I had to, not that you're drunk or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, that came out wrong. No, I... Uh, I stayed because I have to do offline for four hours. So I slept here until about eight o'clock. So I got out at 430, slept until about eight o'clock, actually nine, almost nine o'clock, worked from nine to one. And I'm, we're here doing these excellent episodes for everybody to listen to. And I have to end up working uh, 430 to 1230 tonight. So yeah, it's been great. <laughs> I haven't had much sleep, but uh Passing all that off to the side, this week we have Brody with Harvey County 911 of Newton, Kansas, dispatch and communicator, and does uh, some tactical stuff on the side with dispatching. How's it going, man? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We are tired. Very tired, bro. We have to keep this interview going, okay? You have all the responsibilities, so you can start asking the questions. Yeah, exactly. You know, I I forgot to bring in my uh, my monster can. I had it in there. It's sitting in the fridge. Yeah, I purposely stopped at the gas station when I got a pop for myself this morning. I grabbed you a monster so you wouldn't be face down on the ground when we started this interview. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure I'm going to fall over here uh, soon. Um, what? Uh, uh, what what schedule do you work, Brody? Do you work nights or something like that? I mean, do you have to go to the uh, the sweet nectar of the gods of Monster <laughs> or, <laughs> or take you know, I, some uh, some hot Java? <laughs> you know, I haven't uh, picked up the Monster yet. I, I'll drink some pop every now and then, but uh, now I'm working second shift right now, so I work uh, four to midnight. I got to go in at four oh. o'clock today. So, oh, nice. Man. Oh, so we're in the same boat. Awesome. Yeah, you feel our <laughs> yeah. pain. Brody, why don't you tell us how you got started in dispatch? I know you actually have quite an extensive history for not being very old. You have a lot of time under your belt already. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been dispatching for, I think I'm coming up on nine years now. Um, started off when I was 18 years old. Uh, I was in college. I needed a job. And I've always been interested in emergency services. Um, yeah, at the time in college, I was studying fire science. Uh, yeah, I went and got my firefighter and EMT certifications and all that. Uh, but when I was in college, you know, this job came up, I went and applied for it and he called me back a couple of weeks later and asked me when I could start. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. Were you going to school full time while you were working a full time position or were they both kind of part time? I was working, uh, or doing college full time. And originally I started off as a part-timer and then about, I think two years later, I went full-time in there. Man. Oh, I, I definitely feel your pain then. I'm, <laughs> I've been going to school pretty much since, uh, since I started working here from, I started in 2005, but in 2006 is when I started going to college. And next month, at the end of next month, I will finally be done, uh, with my master's actually. So I feel your pain, man, working uh, full time and uh, doing this job because this job, you know, can be crazy and you got to cram in the schoolwork somewhere. It, you really do. Um, you know, it's amazing that I didn't fail college when I was uh, first <laughs> starting all this because you know, I, I was sitting there working full time when I was in training and I pretty much didn't go to class for about a month. So it's amazing they didn't fail me that semester. 
No kidding. <laughs> Brody, why don't you talk a little bit about the county where you work in? It looks like, I, I've looked at it on the map, it looks like it's like south central Kansas kind of. Yeah, Harvey County is in south central Kansas. Um, the county seat's Newton. We're about 30 minutes north of Wichita. Um, roughly a population of, I think, 35,000, something like that. Um, as far as the counties here in Kansas go, uh, I think we're definitely one of the smallest. Um, I think we're fourth or fifth on the list, something like that. Yeah, because when I was judging how big your county is by the population, I thought, oh, are there are there little pockets throughout Harvey County that are more populated? Or is it pretty much rural all the way through other than Newton? Um, yeah, we have, uh, I think there's like seven cities, something like that. Um, but Newton is definitely where a majority of the population is. Newton has, uh, I think they're just shy of, uh, 20,000 right now. And then, you know, we have some other smaller towns. I think the biggest there is only a couple thousand people though. Um, you know, we're definitely, uh, more of a rural county. Uh, but like I said, you know, we, we have them kind of spread out all over the place. Okay. And now the interesting thing with you, you know, when we go, when we filter through applications for people who apply to be on the show or when we reach out through people that have been um, recommended to us, you had a really interesting subset. Your niche is kind of more a little, I mean, this is an intense job as it is, but why don't you go ahead and explain what you do on the side other than full-time 911 dispatcher in your call center. Talk about what else you do and we'll go from there. Sure. Um, one of the extra duties that some of us have, uh, we're, we're tactical dispatchers. Um, so instead of, you know, like we do in the center, we're dealing with 5, 10, 15 instants all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Instead of doing that, I go out in the field with uh, you know, the SWAT team, the fire department, whoever's needing us, and I provide communications for uh, whatever the instant that they're working is. So essentially, I'm focused only on that incident uh, and you know, helping to make sure everything runs smoothly there. You know, a lot of us know that communications is pretty much the backbone of emergency services. And on large scale incidents, if you don't have good communications, you know, the incident is not going to run well. So we go out there and make sure that they have what they need to uh, operate effectively on scene. Now, when you say we, is there more than one person with you? Or is it just you? Do you take, uh, you know, like the A-team van out there? And <laughs> I mean, are you no, taking there's a truck a, or a snowmobile? Yeah. <laughs> we, <Segway. laughs> there goes Brody by. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, there's uh, there's five of us that uh, work this right now. Um, okay. But when we go out in the field, we have a, a comm truck that we take with us. Uh, you know, has a nice. ACU. It's, I think, stands for Advanced Communications Unit, something to that effect. Um and a 40 foot mast on it. Um, we can, we can set up a repeater out in the field, just pretty much wherever we're at. Uh, so usually two or three of us will go out and we'll take the truck with us and, uh, run from the truck. Man, that sounds pretty awesome. Now, if, uh, let's say your dispatch center was to go down, is that truck that you guys take out? Is that the same thing that would use, you know, kind of like a command center to run the entire dispatch operations from there? Or is that just specifically to, you know, like a SWAT team um, or these tactical communications uh, runs that you guys do? You know, we can uh, run at least the radio stuff from the truck. Um, South Central Kansas is unique in the state of Kansas in that we have a regional backup center. And, you know, that's uh, over in Reno County. Um, but, you know, we can we can transfer all the phones over to this backup center and then radio everything back to us in Newton. And then we can broadcast it from there. Um, so, you know, the radio stuff we can still do from the from the truck. We just can't do anything as far as the phones go. Oh, OK. Gotcha. Yeah, because we have uh, a command center that um, they just started showing all the supervisors how to how to run it. Uh, we're actually supposed to go out and learn how to drive it, which I don't know how hard it would be, but it sounds like they would be taking us out to like a parking lot, throw out some cones and maybe do some uh, stunt maneuvers, <laughs> which, would be, <laughs> which would be pretty fun. But um, yeah, they were just showing us how to use it in case anything ever happened in our dispatch center. We could go out to the command center and run it from there. But I mean, looking inside it, um, it's got all the essentials except the bathroom is almost like a mm-hmm. closet. I mean, 
there's actually stuff all piled in there. I was going to say, you it's can't. It's all paperwork, that's not yeah. functional for a bathroom. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what we would do, I guess. It's good. I spend a lot of time backpacking, so I guess. I'm, we do have a microwave in there, though, so. What, to go to the bathroom? Yeah, we can pee in there, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, our truck, we we don't have anything real fancy. Um, our truck is actually a used ambulance we've picked up from one of the fire departments here in Harvey County. And then um, my bosses, you know, they went through and they – uh, retrofit the entire thing uh, to make it more usable for what we need to do it for. Um, I, so really, we're we're sitting in the back of an ambulance with you know, all the radios and everything else in there. It's, yeah. it's definitely cramped quarters. Any uh, are there any memorable calls that you can think of that you've taken? I mean, even like your first nine hundred one call that you took, because you're talking about you know, your training earlier and everything. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I guess we can start with that. What kind of training did you even go through? Was there was there a group of people that uh, that you were with? I know that uh, um, a few years back we had about three or four people that were training together is how they started out. And then, you know, they just kind of fallen out <laughs> there. And I think maybe right. one or two made it. But um, what was your training like? Um, our training, baby, it's all on the job training. Um, you know, I showed up at midnight one night and sat down with my trainer. Uh, I think there's two of us uh, that started. Um and, you know, so we just, a lot of on-the-job training and went through the policy manuals and everything else. Um, you know, as far as calls, I always laugh about this this one. Um, you know, it was about the time where I was learning to take calls and everything. And we were working on, you know, entering the disconnect calls. You know, obviously you have to call that when whatever number of calls back. And you do a follow-up. Um, so, you know, I called the number back and, you know, I, I gave my whole spiel, everything and everything just perfectly. And then I look at my phone and I realized I called the wrong number. And this is like oh, no. three <laughs> in the morning, I woke some lady up out of bed and she's probably sitting there in her head like, you know, what the heck's going on here? But, uh, yeah, I got a horribly wrong person for nothing. Yeah, this went perfectly, though. So I guess there's that. Oh, uh, no, that's. <laughs> that's always the worst when when you go to call somebody back and they they pick up and you're you go through your whole thing and you're waiting for them to answer and it's um well hello, are you there I, you got the wrong number what are you calling for oh i'm really <laughs> really sorry you know what can you do but you know all you can do is apologize and then maybe mm-hmm. laugh later or cry, depending on if you get yelled right. at or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, no, I, I'm yeah. pretty sure we all sat there and had a pretty good laugh afterwards. So it was, it was pretty funny after the fact. Brody, can you talk about anything? Are you able to talk about any of those tactical, like the SWAT call outs that you've done, you've been a part of recently or, you know, something that your center has taken care of? Just to give you, you know, a feel of how you approach that situation. Yeah, there you go. When you're out, right. Yeah, when you're out in the field. Um, as far as the SWAT goes, you know, I can, I can only speak in real general terms about it. Um, of course. You know, a lot of that stuff is still is tied up in the court system. Yep, uh, so just you know, to not mess any of that up, I really can't say too much about it. Um, the the one thing I I really can say about it though, is that you know the team absolutely loves having us there. Um, you know, they used to run without dispatcher. And since working with them uh, for, I don't, I don't even know how long we've had this team going. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, the, the commander has gone around to every SWAT team in the area said, you guys need to have dispatchers out there with us. So yeah, we're, we're definitely providing essential. Um, but as far as specifics on instance, as far as SWAT goes, uh, I really can't say Okay, so let's set up a scenario. Say that we have a SWAT team called out for a barricaded gunman. So you have your barricaded gunman there, and he's got a hostage. So now we have, like, an innocent party involved. As a tactical dispatcher, when you're on scene, are you just providing, like, um, communications between the different SWAT members? Are you relaying information? Are you serving as, like, a media checkpoint where media can get a news release or you know, you don't have to give us specifics, but just so Ricardo and I both understand as well as our listeners, what do you do while you're out there? Uh, really, we don't, we don't media. That's, that's the one thing that we will not do. Um, all we're dealing with is provide comms services for the team members. Um, so, you know, that may be 
just logging stuff. Um, usually one of us, our only job is logging stuff. Um, another one of us will go out and we're get essentially attached to the team commander's hip. We follow over the place, making sure that he has the information that he needs, but also passing instructions on to the team that's downrange. Um, and then obviously, you know, there's the technical aspect. You know, we have up uh, the interoperability stuff between you know, like our team and a neighboring team and on a digital system or you know whatever needs to be done there you know we're there to do it um, but our services are only for the team okay so it's real specific site specific you're not going to answer any overflows from your center or anything like this right now we're when we're doing this we're out the field with the team and you know we're only working for the team we're not dealing with anything else that may be going on in the county. Well, that's pretty good then, because you don't want to take any of that attention away or anything or, you know, tie you guys up in any way like that. Um, And you might have said it already, but um, how do you guys get called out to that? Do you have a type of pager or is there a cell phone? Do you guys get a group text message? I know that when we have tech calls or um, our dive team, when they have to go out for, you know, water rescue or something, we will go on to our, uh, this email um, account that we have and we send something out and it'll send something directly to everybody and everybody gets it on their phone. So they know to start heading out there and we'll hear them right away, come up on the radio. So are you guys part of that? Uh, something like that as well, or yeah, they just call you um, on your phone or how does it work? Uh, really the same way that uh, you were just describing there. Um, we get paged from an email account in dispatch and that just comes straight to my phone. You know, at that point I have to call into dispatch and tell them that I'm 10, four on the page. And then, uh, you know, we go meet up wherever we need to meet up and then, you know, head out to do what we got to do. Is somebody responsible for getting the, the truck or is that already going to go out when the SWAT team gets called out? Uh, yeah, one of us who uh, who's going out there, we have to go and get the truck. Uh, either usually it ends up uh, at the rally point before we before we all leave. You know, but sometimes yeah. we may have to go pick it up wherever it is. Uh, but yeah, someone has to go get it before we uh, can do anything. Hmm. Uh, have you guys been trained at all in any of the uh, you know zombie apocalypse type things that you would have? <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's not something we've covered, but I think I'm going to bring that up at training next week. All right. We we keep talking specifically about SWAT calls. Have you been in, involved in any big like water rescue things? I think, I don't know how big the Little Arkansas River is, but I know it runs through there. Has there been anything significant that you know of? Um, well, first off, it's not the Little Arkansas River. If you come to Kansas and call it that, you're probably going to get slapped by someone. Um, call it. Oh, no. And we don't want to get in these parts here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we call it the Little Arkansas River, um, oh. you know, because it's Kansas and not Kansas. That's the way I like to put it. But uh, yeah, that, <laughs> nice. that particular river, um, we're in such a drought right here. That's so low. So we haven't really done anything with that. Uh, but the one thing that we have done quite a bit of is going out and working grass fires. Um, yeah. And so. in the in the part of the county I live in, I live over on the western part of the county. Uh, there's some sand hills out here, and it's all just scrubland. It's it's worthless land for the most part, uh, but they'll get grass fires going in there. And a couple, I think it was like five years ago, six years ago, something like that. Uh, we had we had a fire out there that burned for three days that our team went out on. Um, this was before I was on the team, uh, but even here, I think last October or so, you know, we had another one out there that. I went out and worked for several hours. You know, so that's something that we do do quite a quite a bit of. When you guys are out there for such a long time, uh, do you guys have people like we have something here called Canteen and we can call them and like if we have a fire uh, fire department out on a huge call and they've been out there for five to six hours or more, we call them up and they get together food, water, you know, I Gatorade think, or anything like that. Isn't that through the Red Cross? And, you know, it might be I, actually. There's, yeah, they call it canteen. Yeah, but, but I think it might yeah, be a division. Yeah, because of... well, we, yeah, because we've called the Red Cross as well uh, for other things. But do you, are you guys able to do that, or do you utilize anything like that when you've been out there that long? Yeah, we do. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll try calling Salvation Army, um, you know, and and usually they're able to you know put something together for us if we need it. 
Um, but, you know, if push comes to shove, I know our sheriff here, he's went out and he's bought just truckloads of water and Gatorade for us on really? fires. Wow. So, you know, he's, he's, uh, we definitely have the resources available to us. And I mean, that's such a great resource to have. Right. No, that is, that's definitely good. Uh, you know, we had a few years back, we had, um, we had a grass fire. It was out, it actually started out in the beach. It was just this brush out there. There were some kids that were shooting off fireworks and they they backfired, I guess, and they landed in the brush and they caught all of this this entire area of this beach on fire as well as houses that were, um, you know, they were about $3 million each. So, yeah, we've had some pretty big uh, house fires or, uh, yeah, house fires, grass fires, you know, everything like that. So, I, but myself, I can't imagine going out there and actually being there. Uh, that day I was on uh, one of our uh, extra channels. And I was directing uh, the officers uh, to go to these different houses. I had to look for them on the map. And they were going out and they were trying to evacuate everybody. And they were having me try to find phone numbers to get these people um, out of there. And people were calling in during this huge fire and saying, you know, this house next to me is catching on fire. Should I leave? I, I see people in <laughs> houses. Should I leave too? Um, yeah, probably. And then I remember this one person specifically yelling, Okay, my roof is catching on fire now. <laughs> I'm going to go. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, you actually being out there, that would be probably even more crazy because then, you know, you're seeing all of this going on and I'm just in dispatch, you know, talking to people. But, yeah, I can't imagine doing what you do. It sounds pretty awesome. It's 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 a part of dispatch that you know, most people probably don't get the chance to with. But I guess from a personal standpoint, I would I would love – if I could turn this in a time job, I would do it hands down. You know, I love being able to go out and work in the field and provide all this stuff for our guys who are out there. Um, I, I mean, like I said, I, I think it's such an essential service that we're providing, especially on these large incidents. I don't know how anyone can go, go without it. Um, right. And, you know, that's something that we're working on here in the state of Kansas. You know, my boss is who started this team. Um, you know, they're going around and they're training other teams on how to do this. And that's, that's the kind of buying that we've been getting from people in the area here. That's just such a great service that we're providing. I mean, it is intense, but you know, after a while, I guess you get used to that and you can just focus on the job. I think an unintended positive of that would be just seeing your surroundings and getting really comfortable with different areas that you dispatch for. Like I'm not real comfortable with the southwest part of our county. I don't know it very well. I've been through it, but I just didn't grow up anywhere near it, and I I don't have any reason to visit it often or whatnot. So I think that would be kind of interesting, too, if you're working in this area and you're looking at it and you're visualizing it and you're seeing the way that traffic moves through there. It's just it's just a beneficial thing to be out in the field for that as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, like, like I mentioned about the Sand Hill fires that we had last year, I don't think I'd ever been out there until... Yeah, you know, I went out there to run the dispatch or the communications end of it. And so getting to go out there and, you know, see what it looks like, you know, see kind of how everything lines up with what I'm seeing on the map in dispatch, that's definitely beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys do like, um, I guess we call it a geo ride, a geography ride. Um, do you go through certain places like that? Uh, do you have specific locations where you think things could go down, you know, like that with big fires? Uh, like you were saying, you go out there and you check it out. Do you think, do you guys do things like that first? Or is it just when you get there is when you start looking around and really familiarize yourself with the area? Pretty much it's when we get there and are able to look around. Um, you know, the fortunate thing with us having a county that's so small, you know, we're, we're generally familiar with how everything is uh, looks out there. Um, but I mean, we don't know the specifics. We don't know it as well as our sheriff's deputies do. Um, but really I mean, we, we get out there and that's when we start figuring everything out for the most part. Brody, how many people do you have working in your center at a time just so we can get a feel for call volume? Um, well, on my shift, I have, I think there's five of us assigned to the shift. Um, and usually there's, at a minimum, three. We like to keep four on first and seconds at all times, and then two on nights. That's for how many people within the county? Uh, 35,000. 
I can't say how many we have in our county. <laughs> I can't think of how many we have. I was going to try to compare, but I, I can't think of how many that we have because we usually have, uh, for us, our minimum is three. Uh, but uh, from like five to nine, our, we have a mandatory four person. I know we um, have over 100,000 people in Allen County. We have upwards of 100 and like almost 115,000, I think. Dang, so we're kicking at the wow. three people as a minimum. Jeez, no wonder <laughs> wow. we all have those Healy shoes where we fly around our dispatch on those shoes. That's right. <laughs> well, and I, yeah, I think um, I think our staffing, as as far as this part of the state, I mean, it's probably a little bit high. Um, one of the counties neighboring us is, well, probably forty or 50,000, and they usually only run with three or four people. If they can get three, they're lucky. Um, so, you know, I know we do have fairly high staffing, but we don't have the same issues that a lot of centers have with uh, retention. Um, a, a lot of our employees have been there for a number of years. I think our our oldest one has been there over 30 years now, and we have one who's uh, coming up on, I think she's coming up on 30. So, you know, we, we, we have really good luck with retention. Hmm. That says a lot about your training program, too, though. That's really good. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you said you've been there. You started when you were 18, right? Right. What was that like for you being an 18-year-old just going into dispatch? I mean. That's a lot of pressure for an 18. You know, I don't, I don't yeah. want to say it condescendingly, but that's a lot of pressure for an 18-year-old boy, kind of. You know, you've just gotten into college. And I know a lot of my buddies that were college age, I don't know if I'd want them to be on the other end of a 911 call. I can tell you that much. <laughs> well, no, you got, you guys are absolutely correct. Um, you know, it is a lot of pressure for an 18 year old to be under and, uh, you know, to, to go back a little bit, you know, um, when I, when I was a kid growing up and everything, my dad was a firefighter and all that. So I, I kind of had an understanding of how the, how the job worked, but, uh, you know, I was also kind of sheltered. Um, you know, I didn't have a real good view of how the how the world actually worked. And you know, going to work in that one center, it, it you know, it opened my eyes up. I was like, oh my god, I, I didn't know the world could be anything like that. Um, but, you know, the first the first year or two, you know, I was uh, I was I was still feeling like I was doing a lot of good for people. Yeah, I was, I was still in love with the job and everything. But, you know, after time goes on, you just, you get more and more jaded. And, um, <laughs> you know, some, that's the stuff that we're working through now. You know, if I had to do it over again, I don't know if I would have, if I would have went when I was 18, but I'm glad I did. I really am. Yeah, we've got uh, one of the, uh, or actually our training coordinator, she started when she was 18. I, I grew up with her, you know, we went to school together and everything. And uh, when I started working here, uh, we were talking about, you know, her first call and everything. And, you know, how she was so young when she started here and everything. And the first 911 call she took was a triple homicide. And uh, yeah, she right. <laughs> she had her trainer wow. with her. And, you know, she let her go with it. She, she you know, she took the call and you know, she did what she had to do. But, you know, that's always one thing that when we have new people that come in and they say, you know, what if I get this and we get this and we say, uh, your training coordinator, your trainer had a triple homicide at her first night of one call while on training. So I think you got yeah. this. Trust me. <laughs> you'll take this barking dog just fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be good. It'll be Absolutely. You know, <laughs> and I got, I, one of the calls that, that will stick with me that I took really early on in my career. And I think part of the reason it sticks with me is just because I didn't go down a line of questioning that I I would have never thought of, uh -huh. uh, you know, before I took this call. Um, but it was a car fire. And, you know, usually car fires are pretty straightforward calls, you know. Right. Um, but this particular one was in an area of the county that had really poor cell phone reception. And I was sitting there trying to figure out where she was because she couldn't tell me where she was in the middle of all the cell phone and everything cutting in and out. And... You know, for the for the one time that the cell phone came in perfectly, this girl got on who was on the phone with me. She you know, hysterical screaming. She says she's in the car. The car's on fire and she's dead. And Gosh. that was you know one of the things that made me say, you know, step back and say, you know, what what just happened here? Because um, you know you you, don't, you never can see stuff like that coming. Um, was the but, you know, that, like I said, that's early on in my career, and that, that kind of changed how I take calls. You know, I try to be a little more thorough with with what I do now, 
you know, compared to what I did then. Brody, just for some follow up for our listeners, was that was that vehicle involved in an arson or was it trying to cover up a homicide and get rid of evidence or was it involved in an accident or? It was a car wreck. Uh, they were out joyriding in the country and hit a tree. And the driver got out and the other girl wasn't able to. Okay. Oh, man. So you had to stay on the phone with that driver. Not only is she sitting there thinking her friend is deceased in the vehicle, but then she probably starts going through all those feelings of, I was the driver, I'm standing here okay. And, you know, that's why I think the public really commends 911 dispatchers because we're in a point where we're on the other end of that line. We can't reach out and hold on to you and say, we're going to make it through this together. All we have is our voice. And, you know, it's, it's interesting when you throw in there the cell phone reception and all that kind of stuff too. It's just, I just think we're a really different breed of people. I, I agree 110% with that. Um, you know, it, it definitely takes a special kind of person to, to be able to work in this job and you have to be able to thrive in this job. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we have heard on the phone, how many people can, how many people can actually handle that? You know, yeah. people will ask you at parties or whatever. Well, tell me about some kind of crazy call you took. And then you tell them about a call like that and uh-huh. they just shut down. They can't, they can't process right. what that would sound like. I mean, we are a different breed of people and you know, I, I, good, better and different. I mean, it's, it's the way it is. Yeah. Well, it was so exciting being able to talk to you, Brody. You really opened up a whole different side of dispatching that Ricardo and I even weren't really familiar with. We're just, we set up a command center. if We need to go out for a big incident that's been planned. So like if big artists are coming into town or, you know, music artists or whatnot. So that was really interesting. And we've kind of tossed around the idea of, you know, what if we did do that? What if we offered that for the sheriff's department and for the state police? So we want to thank you for that. Well, no, thank you guys for having me and, you know, keep up the good work. You guys are doing an awesome thing here. We Thank appreciate you. it, man. Thank you very much. And this is going to be the wrap up of episode number 10. And uh, we can just hang tight for just a moment. Just going to wrap this up here. Um, just want to do a quick shout out to the Thin Gold Line. They are on Facebook. They have got uh, interesting information on their articles, some funny memes. If you guys want to learn about dispatch, go to them and check them out. I will make sure to put a link on, on the blog post for this episode that will be uh, putting up here and for uh, anything as always you guys can send us emails to the jcast at the jebralog.com or a wtt podcast at gmail.com and if you guys have an interesting subset you know if you're a dispatcher and you want to be on our show and you have something really interesting we we strongly recommend getting a hold of us because brody actually reached out to us and he said hey i do something that's pretty cool i'd like to be on the show so exactly Go ahead and shoot us an email. Yes, definitely. Um, Any suggestions? Um, I got a message yesterday about uh, people giving us suggestions, you know, questions that we can answer during a show. So we're going to start doing that. Um, Not next episode, but the episode following that, we're going to get some more questions so that we can tie them in with the different people that we talk to. And uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at Jabberlog, and you can find all these posts at thejabberlog.com. Thank you very much once again. Thanks, Brody. Hey, thank you, guys. You just listened to Within the Trenches on the Jcast. If you have any questions or would like to be a guest on the show, send an email to thejcast at thejabalog.com.